Hi, I'm Steve Halliday and this is our sixth video on Raspberry Pi bare metal programming. As you may recall in the previous video, we built a very simple assembler. It wasn't a full-blown assembler, it just had enough instructions that we were able to build the simple LED blinking program that we wanted to write. As we go forward, we'll extend our assembler. In this video, what we're going to do is extend it enough so that we're able to create subroutines and call them. In our previous video, we wrote this program that blinks the LED. This is a program that our assembler will consume. And it works pretty well, but we have one complaint about it. And that is this code here, as you may recall, is the same as this code here, with the exception of the labels being a little bit different. It's generally considered bad form to have duplicate code in your program, so let's see what we can do to try and eliminate this code by extracting it into a subroutine. What we're hoping to end up with is something like I've depicted in this slide. In this slide, this rectangle represents memory, the memory on your Raspberry Pi. And of course, as you may recall, R15, register 15 is the program counter, so it's pointing to some section of memory here, which contains our main program, as I've explained here with this little rectangle up here. You'll notice that this turns on the LED, branches to subroutine to wait for a while, turns off the LED, branches to the subroutine again to wait for a while, and then branches back to the top of the loop. And this is the main idea behind our blinking LED. Down here, this section represents another piece of memory that actually holds our subroutine. You can see that we initialize R2 to a counter here, and then we increment R2 and we go through this loop until we reach 400,000 hex, which is what causes the delay. And then at that point, we want to branch back to our main code. The problem that we have with this approach is when we branch back to the main code, we can't branch to a label like we have in the previous examples where we branched here to a label and branched here to a label because the label would be different when we call the subroutine here than when we call the subroutine here. So somehow we need to figure out when we're in the subroutine where to go back to. What we might want to do is take the program counter and store it in register zero and then use that to calculate where we want to return to. And the way we would do that calculation is we would add 4 to register 0, and store that back in register 0, and then we could branch the subroutine here, and when we're all done with the subroutine, we could take what's in R0, move it into the program counter, and that would cause us to start back on this instruction here. One question you might have is, why are we adding 4 to the program counter that we captured up here that we're now using in register zero. So here's where the four comes from. Remember when we did the infinite loop, we had to branch minus two from our current location. That had to do with the prefetch in the pipeline. Well, if we take that minus two and then we figure that's where the program counter is at this point, but we have to add one, two, three instructions to get to this instruction here. So the minus two plus three gives us one, and then each instruction is four bytes. So we have to multiply that one by four, and that's where we get the four that we're going to add to register zero here, so that when we return from our subroutine, everything works out. All that calculation turns out to be kind of complicated and a, a lot of work that we're going to have to do quite often, in fact, every time that we call a subroutine. So the ARM architects realized that that was going to be error prone and be a lot of work, and so they helped us with their instruction set a little bit. You may recall that on the branch instruction, there's a link bit that you can set. And so you can use a, an instruction called branch with link. And what that does is that sets the return address in R14. In fact, it does all this calculation for us and sticks the return address in R14. So we can do a branch with link to the subroutine, and then the way we return from the subroutine is just like we were doing before. We move the return address that's in R14 into R15, and that puts us back at the line right after the call to the subroutine. Well, this simplifies calling subroutines, and we may think that we have conquered subroutines at this point. But there's actually a, some more complexities we need to think about here. What happens if the subroutine is using the same registers that the calling routine is using? For example, here in our program that we've written to blink the LED, we're using R0 and R1 
to store some values that we're going to use throughout our loop here, our main loop. But what if the subroutine didn't know that and started using R0 as its counter? How could we prevent some kind of a register collision problem like we have here? What we might do is at this point right here, save our registers before we start mucking around with them. And then when we're all done, we can restore the registers to what they were when they first came in. What do we mean by save the registers? Well, what we might do is we might allocate a chunk of memory somewhere where we could write the registers and then read that chunk of memory back into the registers later on. And so it might look something like this. Remember, this represents our memory address space. And so we could allocate a chunk of memory here and we'd write the registers out and then read them back. And we would think that was pretty cool until one day we decided we wanted to do something like write a recursive algorithm. <laughs> and so when we'd go to save our registers, the second time that we would call our subroutine, our recursive subroutine, we might end up writing over what we wrote the first time. So what we'd really like to do is we'd like to add on to that memory. And when we do that, we would keep a register that would basically keep track of where we are. What that would be is what we would call a stack. Now, in the ARM processor, by convention, register 13 is the stack pointer, and it does exactly that. So the first time that we save registers, we can push them on the stack, and they would go to some place here, and then we would increment R13. And then the next time we would call a routine, it would push some more registers on the stack. And then as we start to return from the routines, we would pull them off of the stack and restore the register values. We've talked about storing these values in memory, but we haven't actually talked about specifically how we would do that. What we'll need to do is extend our assembler a little bit. We'll use the lo load and store instruction. We used that in the previous video to access peripherals, but we can use it to also access memory. And since the stack is in memory, we can use it to access the stack too. Now there's a few things you need to understand about the stack when you start to use R13 for your stack. The first thing is that you need to initialize R13 to point at some location in memory that you plan on using for your stack. I've had students in the past that didn't initialize R13. What happens is R13 points at location zero in memory which happens to be an interrupt vector, which we'll talk about hopefully in a couple more videos. And that can have real disastrous effects when you start pushing your stack over your interrupt vector. So you want to choose some place in memory. What you're going to want to do is to, you know, kind of map out your memory like this and decide where it makes sense that you're not going to get into any trouble if you start using some memory locations. Then you also need to decide, is my stack going to grow up or down? When I grow my stack, do I increment the stack pointer or do I decrement the stack pointer? It doesn't really matter which direction the stack grows, but you just need to be consistent. Additionally, you need to decide, does the stack pointer point at a full or an empty memory location? It can do either one. Once again, you just need to be consistent. So if it points at a full location, then you need to increment the stack pointer before you store something at the location where the stack pointer points. Whereas if it's empty, you can store it and then increment the stack pointer afterwards. Those are a couple of design issues that you need to think through and decide which way you want to do it. Also, one other thing we can do is we can use what's called write back. There's a bit on the load and store instruction when you, in fact, I think I can go to it here. If we look at the load and store instruction, there's a bit here, this W bit. This is a write back bit. And what this does is when I load or store, then it usually takes the base address and adds the offset. And then if I have the right back bit set, it's going to take that calculated address and write that back to the base address. So this can be helpful if you're just kind of incrementing through your stack, you can push using the right back bit and it essentially does a push on your stack and then the next time you can push again because your base register gets updated every time. And one of the conventions that ARM uses for the right back bit is this exclamation mark. So this would be store immediate with right back. The value that's in R0 
to the base address pointed to by R13 plus 4, and then when you're all done, take that calculated address and update R13 with it. Also, there's actually a store multiple instruction, which will store multiple registers all in one instruction for you. Uh, you may want to investigate that in your ARM instruction manual. One last complexity that we need to consider is how do we pass parameters to our subroutine? For example, we might want to be able to vary the amount of time that we delay, and we could do that by changing the counter that we pass to our subroutine. There's different ways to do that. You might consider agreeing on a memory location that the subroutine would always look for to find the parameters passed to it. The problem with storing the parameters in a memory location, once again, is we've hit a recursive problem. If I have to have a subroutine call itself, I could end up overwriting the first parameters with the second parameters, and I might need them still. We could also agree on registers that we want to use. This might allow us to be recursive, assuming we stored away our registers each time we entered the routine. But the problem is that it's not too easy to come up with a convention like this. I guess you could always say that register 0 is parameter 1, register 1 is parameter 2, and so forth. But what if you're using those registers for something else? It could be a little bit confusing. We could try passing the parameters on the stack. This is the way we solved the recursive problem before that we had. And sure enough, this would be very general purpose, but it is a bit slow. What we'd like is some kind of a hybrid approach where we can use registers and the stack. And the way we do that is to conceptualize the, the stack and the registers as if the registers are the virtual top of the stack. So you use registers until you run out of registers, and then you push those registers onto the stack uh, one by one as you need to make space for them. Here's an example of the program using the stack to pass parameters. I haven't addressed the question of how to use registers to virtualize the top of the stack. I'll leave that as another proof to the reader, but let's focus on how, the, how it would work to use just the stack. So you see, right before I call the subroutine, I would store the counter onto the stack, and then when I'm in the subroutine, I can retrieve that counter from the stack. Now, I'm not going to treat the stack like a formal stack where I can only access the top member of the stack, but I will access values relative to the top of the stack. So, for example, parameter 1 might be on the top of the stack, and parameter 2 might be 4 bytes down from the top of the stack, and so on and so forth. Another thing that's important to note here is that when I return from the subroutine, I need to pop the parameters off the stack. Otherwise, my stack will continue to grow, and uh, I'll run out of memory, and I'm not really using these parameters once I return back from the subroutine, so I ought to clean up. It's important to clean up at the same level that you create the space. So when I push here, I should pop here. I shouldn't push here in the main routine and pop down here in the subroutine. If, if you start to do that, things get a little bit messy. It's real easy here to see that, yes, I push something and I pop something. So try and keep that in mind. So at this point, we've covered most of the topics for calling subroutines. We've talked about how to call a subroutine and return from it. We've talked about how to deal with registers and make sure we keep a, what we call a stack context or a, a procedure context on the stack frame. And then here we've talked about how to pass parameters. And you can go on and extend your assembler a little bit. You'll need to extend it by adding a branch with link instruction. And then also you want to make sure that your store and your load instructions also have the write back capability as well. And if you do that, then you ought to be able to write this program, get your LED blinking using the subroutines. And that's kind of fun to see that happen. So this brings us to the end of our sixth video. If you have any questions, please feel free to email me at sumpyguy at gmail.com. I will try and address questions that I have in future videos.